Welcome to the Reasonable Faith Podcast with Kevin Harris and Dr. William Lane Craig. Bill, this is not exactly a topic that um, I like to talk about. I don't think anybody wants to talk about the topic of hell. It's in the news lately. It is. Um, In particular, the uh, works of Rob Bell. Uh, What do you know about this controversy? Well, this made the cover of Time magazine, so it's obviously made a splash in popular culture. Rob Bell is a very popular megachurch pastor who I think has rather shocked the evangelical community by coming out against the traditional Christian doctrine of hell and eternal damnation. Not that he adopts annihilationism, which some other evangelicals have moved to. but And what would that be? Well, that would be the view that God simply destroys the damned, that he annihilates them. And some people, like John Stott notably, have adopted annihilationism as their view of the afterlife for the unsaved. But Bell's position is more radical. He has adopted a position that's actually been condemned by the church as heretical, and that is that the damned will have post-mortem opportunities for salvation, and eventually a God of infinite love wins out and everyone will be saved. Hell will be emptied, or the uh, realm of the separated lost will be emptied, and everyone will be won over by God's love and be saved. This is not our first rodeo when it comes to hell. We've done podcasts on it. Your famous debate with Bradley has been viewed time and time again on the topic of hell. For one thing, we want to um, refer people to that debate. Uh, tell us a little about that debate. For anyone well, who that was seen. a debate that I had with Dr. Ray Bradley, who is a very prominent philosopher, several years ago at the Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. And Bradley was a very vituperous opponent. He had slides, I think, of a Catholic priest that he called Father Furness, who seemed to delight in the idea of burning the unsaved in hell and uh, all sorts of colorful and very emotionally tendentious sorts of slides and PowerPoints in opposition to the Christian doctrine of hell. And he raised a number of philosophical objections to the doctrine as well, which then I did my best to address in a responsible way. And in addition to that, Kevin, in the meantime since the debate, I have responded to questions about this in the question of the week several times. So if folks are interested, they can consult the archive there, and they'll find quite a bit of discussion. In fact, I think there are few, if any, Christian philosophers, Kevin, who have been more forthcoming in addressing, in print and in debate, the questions raised by the traditional doctrine of hell, as I have. Plenty of resources at reasonablefaith.org. So go there, get some of the basic questions answered. We're going to talk about it again because uh, we're starting to get some questions flowing in. Bill, my own anecdotal observation of doing work in apologetics is that the number one objection uh, is usually some form of the problem of evil. Number two would be the age of the universe. Is the universe old or young, according to biblical teaching? And then number three would be hell, would be the concept of hell as just intolerable and there's no way it could be true and so on. I guess that this breaks down to two things about hell. One, the duration of it. Is it eternal or temporary? And number two, what's it like? In particular, is it really going to be a place where you feel your flesh burning for all of eternity? So what are we to understand Well, I think there are two ways in which the objection to hell could be framed. One would be that it's inconsistent with the love of God, and then the other objection would be that it's inconsistent, ironically, with the justice of God, that a just God wouldn't send people to hell. And so that would be a convenient way of separating the objections and dealing with them one at a time. Is there room to doubt that the flames of hell are the chemical combustion that we're familiar with on this earth? I think so. It seems to me that the images of the state of the damned in the New Testament are meant to be pictorial metaphors, 
Sometimes it talks about the outer darkness where the, the worm does not die, uh, or other times it will use the image of the lake of fire and so forth. And I don't have any confidence that these are meant to be taken to be literal descriptions as opposed to metaphorical images of how awful it is to be separated from God. And I don't want to minimize the horror of hell because even if it doesn't consist in physical punishment, the idea of eternal separation from God is horrific and is a, a terrible, terrible punishment, the worst state anyone can be in. So these physical images, if they are that, are nevertheless meant to express the agony and the pain and the anguish of the damned who are eternally separated from God. You've pointed out that the Bible never describes hell as a torture chamber. That's certainly true. These medieval paintings of hell where you have torture racks and red-hot pinchers and uh, other sorts of tortures being inflicted on the damned are clearly a reflection of the dungeons of medieval Europe rather than a reflection of biblical teaching. That is, that's very clear. So it's a place of torment, which is internal, as opposed to a place of torture, which would be an external or physical thing. It's not clear, I would say, that it involves, as you said, flames of fire that burn a person up. I think that is meant to express in a pictorial way the horror and the anguish of the essence of hell, which is separation from God. In 2 Thessalonians 1.5, Paul says that those who do not know God will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction and separation or exclusion from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. And I take it that that represents the essence of what damnation is, is it's this state of eternal separation from the presence of God and hence all that is good and lovely and wonderful and just being left with one's own selfish, crabbed heart forever. I wish I had a nickel for every time I've heard the objection that God created the world so that if you don't believe certain things, you're threatened with hell. And it really, that kind of gets the cart before the horse. Oh, I think so. How so? Well, I don't think God ever intended anybody to go to hell. That wasn't his intention. In fact, it says in the book of Revelation that the so-called lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels. No human being is ever intended to be there. The only reason that anybody goes to hell is because they freely and irrevocably reject God and his purposes for their life and therefore thrust God from themselves. So I think it's against God's will that people go to hell. And in that sense, it's quite a misnomer to say God sends people to hell. People send themselves. John is very clear on this in that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that we were condemned already. In other words, we already had this problem. This is not a problem that was created in order to promote the cure. <laughs> no, you know? <laughs> that would be utterly yeah. a mistaken understanding of the New Testament. Well, it is. And so what we have is we have this separation problem already, which is why Christ came. Yes, and I think, Kevin, that people's repugnance with the doctrine of hell is, I suspect, largely a reflection of the fact that we have lost a consciousness of human sinfulness. In bygone ages where people had a robust sense of our sinfulness and how wicked we are, it wasn't difficult to believe that apart from the grace of God, we were on our way to eternal perdition. But our modern culture has largely lost a sense of human sinfulness and wickedness and how really desperately evil we are. We, we have the view that we're basically good folks and that everybody is down deep, really a good person. The sort of Dr. Phil mentality, get in touch with your authentic self. And the thought would be unthinkable that your authentic self might be evil and twisted and wicked. That would just be 
unthinkable for these modern folks. Uh, instead, everyone is really a, a good person deep down. And so the idea that people could actually deserve eternal separation from God is just a foreign concept to folks because they've lost this sense of human sinfulness in comparison with God. And that probably, in turn, is a reflection of the loss of the doctrine of the holiness of God. I don't think people understand the idea of God's terrible purity and holiness and his inability to look upon sin with equanimity, to countenance sin. We've lost the doctrine of God's holiness. We, we think of God as one British journalist said, as a sort of chap up there, and wonder why should this chap be so incensed with our uh, foibles and failures, because we've lost a sense of the holiness of God. So, Bill, then the controversy seems to be with Rob Bell, and there are some prominent journalistic publications that say that he may be changing Christianity. He may be changing the face of Christianity and what Christianity is considered. It's hard to pin Rob Bell down on his view because he doesn't really claim to be a universalist, but then all of his indications in his writings are that he is some sort of a universalist, that God's love would just not abandon anyone to such a terrible fate. Well, that goes back to what you just said about the holiness of God. Right, and human free will. If you believe in human libertarian free will, then God cannot coerce people to believe in him, and it's always possible that someone will stubbornly resist every freedom-permitting initiative of God. Of course, God could overwhelm people with a vision of him that would be so attractive, so irresistible that they would be drawn to him. And in a sense, that's what our Calvinist brethren do believe God does. He provides or imparts irresistible grace to people. But if you believe in libertarian free will, that makes the doctrine of hell not so hard to believe. Uh, given human sinfulness and depravity, I don't find it difficult at all to think that some people would resist every freedom-permitting effort of God to win them over. In fact, I've had, I've had debates with people like this. I think of Henry Morgenthaler in Canada, whom I debated, who said, even if God were to prove to me that he exists, I still would not bend the knee hmm. to worship him because I don't think you should worship anybody. You shouldn't bend the knee to anyone. And I've heard many others say that as well, that even if Christianity were true and they knew it to be true, they would not bend the knee and worship God. They would prefer to repudiate him, and if that means being sent to hell, then to hell they will go. So if you have a commitment to libertarian freedom, the, the very fact that God is not a coercive God makes the doctrine of hell very plausible. Hell is apparently not created for man, but for the devil and his angels. Now, the angelic realm of beings would be immaterial. So what sort of place then would, would hell be? Oh, no, that's an interesting thought, Kevin. I, I hadn't thought of that angle before. That would give some grounds for thinking, for example, that the lake of fire is a metaphorical image rather than a sort of geographical place. A place of quarantine, a yes. place of, of torment, a place of regret, a place of separation from the only source of love and life, yes. God himself, and uh, we have no idea what they would be like. There, there will be a resurrection body, Bill, and the redeemed in Christ will be like Christ in his resurrection, glorified bodies. I don't know, is there going to be any kind of a uh, body in hell? Well, that, that's a very good question, and it does seem to suggest in, uh, I believe, Daniel, it talks about the resurrection of the just and the unjust, and does seem to suggest that the damned will also receive some sort of corporeal existence. And that would give me pause about simply dismissing these physical images as images. If there is a kind of body that, that the damned have, then perhaps there would be physical agonies associated with hell too. I think here we're just basically out of our depth. We, we, we don't know and so we can only speculate. Yeah, and perhaps it's just not, even if there are physical things, it's not like what we understand here on Earth in that 
If Jesus' teaching on the rich man and Lazarus is not merely a parable, but actually gives us some insight, and there's controversy on whether it's parabolic, a, you know, a parable, or if it's not, if it's not, and we get some insight into the afterlife, we have a man who's having a conversation, even though there seems to be these physical manifestations of flames and things like that. And, and Bill, if you're in flames, you're not having a conversation. Right. You know, and he's having a rational, cogent, back and forth <laughs> conversation. Yeah. So apparently, it's not the same as if uh, you were on fire today. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, and I think it would be dangerous hermeneutically to press these sorts of parables for doctrine with respect to the the afterlife. I, I think that the parables are intended to make one basic point, and again. We need to be very cautious in trying to draw inferences because of the imagery that they use. Bill, there's something about passing out of this body and the self or the soul continues on, receives a resurrection body and so on. That seems to be a cutoff point. After death, there seems to be something about the afterlife that tends to be kind of too late. Oh, I agree, Kevin. I think this idea of a post-mortem salvation is foreign to the New Testament. I don't see that anywhere in the New Testament. And that's why, as I say, the early church condemned the early theologian Oregon for his Rob Bell-like doctrine. He believed that eventually all the damned would be saved and reconciled to God. And Oregon consistently, I think, went so far as to say that eventually all the demons and Satan himself would be reconciled to God. And I wonder if Rob Bell is willing to go that far. Does he think that Satan will ultimately experience salvation, that all the demons will come to know redemption uh, and reconciliation to God? That's what Oregon thought. And he was condemned by the church for this view uh, as as a heresy, despite the fact that Oregon was one of the greatest of the church's uh, thinkers at that time. You notice the bill that we could really go over each scripture and do exegesis on each scripture and everything, but what we're trying to do is do a little broader philosophical, theological overview of what's well, going on. Well, and I think both need to be done, Kevin. Sure. There, there are really two issues here. First, what does the New Testament teach about the state of the afterlife? What does it teach about the doctrine of hell? And then the second one would be, are there any philosophical problems or objections to the biblical teaching. Now, I take it that someone like a Rob Bell claims at least to be offering an exposition of what the Bible actually teaches. And I think there he's simply erroneous. I think that our atheist friends have the more credible position where they say, yes, the Bible teaches the doctrine of hell, and now we object to that doctrine as morally unconscionable. We think that doctrine is false. Someone like Bell will say, well, no, the Bible doesn't teach that doctrine. And there you do need to do a serious exegetical study okay. of the New Testament. I've already mentioned 2 Thessalonians 1.5 is teaching that there will be eternal destruction and separation from the presence of the Lord for those who don't believe in Christ. And Matthew 25 talks about the judgment where the sheep and the goats are separated and the one goes away into eternal punishment, and the other to eternal life. And the word that is used there for eternal punishment is the same word, Kevin, that is used to describe the eternal life to which the blessed go. So people who say, well, things like this, the Greek word ionios just means age-long or age-lasting or, or something of that sort, not necessarily eternal, they need to understand the way the word is used in especially a passage like this is exactly the same for the eternal life that God gives those who know him as it is for the eternal punishment of those who have rejected him. Exactly. You really can't get around it. It's the same duration. Bill, maybe we need to distinguish what the real problem is. And one of them seems to be Rob Bell and others don't want to threaten people with hell, and people don't want to be threatened with hell. But perhaps there's a difference between a threat and a warning. A threat is motivation to get you to do or behave a certain way. A warning is, these are the facts. These are the facts of the life in the universe, in God's universe, and the the kindest, most gentle 
man that ever lived, Jesus Christ, warned us of hell. Yes. That should give us It's pause. like a doctor giving you a diagnosis that you've got terminal cancer unless you treat it. He is giving you a warning about a terrible condition that you're in, and it would be unloving for him to withhold this information from you because it might be painful to learn that you're dying of cancer. Well, we are all dying of sin. We've got a terminal condition here called sin that if untreated by the grace of God and the atoning death of Jesus Christ will result in eternal destruction. And so, of course, people need to be alerted to this fact and given the solution, given the cure, which is the blood of Christ. Norm Geisler, our good buddy, said something that kind of made me slap my forehead one time because it changed my thinking on it a little bit. He said, there are plenty of people in history who have come to Christ for fear of hell, because of fear of hell. And, and we say, well, we don't want you to come to Jesus for fear of hell, out of fear or things like that. And he said, hey, there are plenty of people who come to Jesus <laughs> Kevin, I, you know, I, for fear of hell. If I can speak personally, as you know, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. And when I first heard the Christian message, it struck me as sort of good news, bad news. On the one hand, it was good news. There's a God who loves me and wants me to know him. On the other hand, the bad news was I was separated from him and I was going to hell. And I have to say that in my own decision to come to Christ during those six months that I thought about this, the love of God drew me, but the fear of God and hell impelled me to Christ. Mm -hmm. So I was both drawn and impelled by the love and the justice of God. Absolutely. Well, apparently there's something intuitive in us that recognizes the reality of justice, of punishment, and if you don't believe in hell, just turn the TV on for five minutes. I mean, there is something intuitive, it seems, that would support this concept of not only separation but also punishment. We see punishment in everyday life. We see consequences. We see that we have a problem, that we have an insanity problem called sin, a spiritual insanity. And so there seems to be an intuitive recognition of this in mankind. Certainly, we yeah. want justice to be done. And if God did not act justly, then it would mean he is not a morally perfect God. If, if he were not a just being, he would not be God. So as Steve Davis, a Christian philosopher, says, we, we can thank God for the wrath of God. It's the wrath of God that saves us, in a sense, because it indicates that we are dealing with a perfectly just being, a morally perfect being, and we can be grateful for that. I think part of the problem, Kevin, is that people think that the reason folks go to hell is because it's punishment for sins like adultery or theft or covetousness, or lying, or things of that sort. And I don't understand that the doctrine of hell to be that Christ has died for those sins. What ultimately sends a person to hell is the rejection of God himself. It is the refusal to accept the grace of God in your life and the provision for sin that he has provided, and pushing God away, putting him at arm's length and saying, I'm going to be Lord of my life rather than bow the knee to you and let you be Lord of my life. And that, I think, is a sin of infinite gravity and proportion because it represents the creature spitting in the face of his creator and rejecting him and not giving him his due. And that, I think, is a, a sin that truly does merit eternal separation and punishment. Bill, this controversy is going to rage. This Rob Bell controversy is something that we'll keep an eye on here at Reasonable Faith and comment on when necessary. It's a, it's a real conversation starter and an opportunity to share your faith as well. We'll wrap up today. I'll ask you two quick philosophical speculations. Are there philosophical problems with annihilationism, that is the utter destruction of even the soul, the annihilation of the winking out of existence of the soul, being that it's immaterial, maybe like God, 
uh, made in the image of God or, or some things like that. You hear where I'm going I, with this? I do hear where you're going, and I have to say, Kevin, I haven't reflected philosophically on annihilationism very much because I guess for me it's a non-starter because I don't think it's the doctrine of the New Testament. And so it just it doesn't even come into play yeah, okay. because I think it's exegetically unfounded. But I could well imagine that there would be problems with annihilationism. For example, if the person is able to sin against God and repudiate God and then simply be annihilated, I would think that he might be well quite satisfied with such a fate, that in fact justice hasn't been done in that case because then you could live the most rotten, evil, God-hating life, and all that means is that then you, the lights are out when you die, that and God annihilates you. And you'll feel nothing and know nothing. And Exactly. Yeah. So in one sense, I'm not sure annihilationism does justice to the justice of God and the evilness of sin and, and the punishment that it merits. If universalism were true, what kind of philosophical ramifications would that have as far as Jesus even needing to, to suffer such a death and pay such a price for our, our atonement? Well, I wouldn't see personally any inconsistency there because the universalist would say it is precisely on the basis of Christ's atoning death that the penalty for all of mankind has been paid. And so the only question is, can God get everybody to freely receive the grace of God and the benefits of Christ's atoning death. And the claim is that if he can't get him to do it in this life, well, he'll get him to do it in the other, the next life. He'll, he'll keep jump-starting them, you know, again and again until he finally gets everybody, and if Oregon is right, even Satan and the demons, to come around and love will win. You see, mm -hmm. that's, that's the idea. So hell would, be, hell would be remedial? Then, well, in a sense, it, hell kind of turns into purgatory in a yeah. way. It, it isn't really the traditional doctrine of hell anymore. It's closer to the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. Hell is just sort of the temporary place where these stubborn people go until God can win them over and, and bring them out of hell and, and get them into heaven. And that's a doctrine that I just don't see anywhere taught in the New Testament. No, that one verse in Matthew just kind of nails it that Jesus said. Yes, I mean, well, it, it and, really and, does. And the verse in Hebrews where it says, it is appointed unto man to die once and then comes judgment. Mm -hmm. Seems to me that excludes this idea of post-mortem salvation. Now, this raises an interesting philosophical objection. Someone might say, well, but what about the person who dies and if only he'd been able to live a little bit longer, he would have maybe heard the gospel or he would have gone to a Billy Graham crusade and been saved or something. And what I want to say is that a God who is equipped with middle knowledge, Kevin, can so providentially order the world that no one who dies and is lost would have been saved had he lived a little bit longer. Molinism middle knowledge, some other things that we have resources on. Oh, it just occurred to me, Bill, have you ever heard any doctrines that there's a possibility that there are levels of punishment in hell? Certainly, uh, I, that is a, a popular doctrine. You see this in Dante's Inferno, for example, the great uh, work on the progression of the soul to heaven. And I would say that there's scriptural grounds for that. Jesus said something along the lines of talking about the court system. Some got more severe punishment than others. And I think a lot of people point to that passage as mm -hmm. that. Again, this doesn't make hell any more tolerable. No. Because ultimately a place of separation from the only source of love yes. and life is a terrible, terrible, tragic fate. It is. It's a tragedy that human beings should end in the trash heap of the universe in this way. And what we want to say as Christians is that the only person to blame for this are the damned themselves. They send themselves there of their own volition by refusing the grace of God and God's every effort to save them. Thank you so much for joining us on Reasonable Faith with Dr. William Lane Craig. We'll see you next time.